I'm Patrick A. Reed, and welcome to Hip Hop and Comics Cultures Combining, presented as part of Comic Con at Home 2021. Now, if you've ever seen or attended one of our hip hop comics programs before, you know that I usually start off with an introduction, introduce our special guests, and then we end up talking through the myriad of ways that comic and hip hop cultures have inspired and influenced one another. We enthuse about the things we love, we lose track of time, we get carried away, and we still end up just sort of scratching the surface of this immensely deep and rich subject. But this time we're going to do something a little bit different, because this summer marks a very special occasion the 35th anniversary of Eric Orr's Rap and Max Robot No. 1, a self-produced black-and-white publication that is now recognized as the very first hip-hop comic book, and serves as the foundation for this entire conversation. Because while before this time, comics and hip-hop cultures had regularly traded inspirations back and forth and crossed over into each other's worlds, this is the moment they truly came together. When a young artist from the South Bronx, the birthplace of hip-hop, took his artistic training, his skills as an artist and a graphic designer, his love of cartooning, and he created something entirely new. And in the process, he solidified larger cultural connections, bringing together the worlds of rap music, street art, the downtown New York art scene of the 1980s, and comic books. And so to commemorate this anniversary, we're doing something special this time around. It's my honor to present to you Eric Orr, the creator of the first hip-hop comic book coming to you live from his studio in the Bronx, in the midst of a massive thunderstorm, so please excuse the sound quality. And I'm also thrilled to welcome a few special guests who are here to comment on, celebrate, and consider the ongoing impact of his creation. Uh, hi, it's Eric Orr here. It's a pleasure to uh, be joining you guys at uh, Comic-Con International. And I'm going to give you a little history of what's going on. Like most of us in the big city here in New York, in the Bronx. I'm a big fan of comic books. And um, as a young man, I used to go to church with my family and my mom used to sit myself, my brother, and my cousins back in the back pews with the Daily News, which was wrapped with uh, comic pages. So we used to, that, that used to keep us quiet. Now, let's fast forward because we want to know how I got to rap and Max Um I was a big, big dance rep. Uh, in my youth, and the uh, the whole hip hop movement and the, the, the robot dance, um, I was a big fan of. I was born in uh, in '59, in the very beginning of uh, of uh, a lot of things, the uh, uh, civil rights movement and all those kinds of things. But because my location, my the neighborhood that I grew up with. Um, I was just kind of immersed in the whole culture. A friend of mine by the name of, old friend of mine by the name of uh, Ree, uh, Freddie Villamar, he also lived on the same block, Daily Avenue. And he was a, 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 an early pioneer of graffiti. And that was my beginnings of the whole graffiti uh, hip hop movement. If it wasn't hip hop then, in the 69, 70s, it wasn't, it wasn't anything but. But uh, uh, you know, people, kids trying to uh, do something to occupy their time. Folks in my age category, you know, you dabbled a little bit in this, a little bit in that. I think comics has always been there. You know, um, I wasn't an avid reader, but I, I'm more of a visual person, so I love the way comics looked graphically and visually. And though Eric, like countless other young artists, applied for the prestigious School of Art and Design in Midtown Manhattan, fate had different plans for him. I didn't get into the school that I wanted. I applied for Art and Design, which all my friends went to, all my my, my, my graph friends went to, but they 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 didn't uh, um, they didn't allow me to get into that school, which is okay because I went to Smith, and at Smith, uh, a friend of mine from my neighborhood. In the Bronx River, we went together, uh, Jazzy J. Again, before he was in all that DJ and, and, and musician and all that kind of stuff, we were friends at, in Bronx River. Um, my cousin lived on Elder Avenue, which is around the corner from him, so I was in, in, the, in Bronx River almost every day. I saw Bam when he brought out his music. Before it was like this big deal. He was playing music out of his window first. Then it, then it grew into this thing where he played in the back of the center. But yeah, we were, we were friends first and that whole, that whole movement, no one saw it coming. It was just something that we entertained ourselves. 
everything about the movement is about young kids in the inner city entertaining themselves. That's what that was. So. Eric also decided, as he began to focus more seriously on his visual art, that he needed to do something to set himself apart from the crowd. So, as taggers and graffiti artists developed ever more elaborate letter forms to render their aliases, Eric went in a different direction, creating a robot head icon that would become his unique signature. Oh yeah, well see, you know, that, again, that's a lot of machismo, you know, there was a lot of uh, gra uh, graph artists that was out there. Everybody's had their name, their Norman Plumes, their Norman Plumes, and their, you know, they had their names and stuff like that. And I was always one of those cats that wanted to be a little bit different. But it was like, everybody's doing, pretty much doing the same thing. How can I be a, a little bit different? But for some reason, I, uh, um, I love robots. And so I created this particular robot. I wanted to be a little bit different. So when I went out and investigated on what, they, what the folks were talking about, about this truck drawing, I saw uh, one of Keith Herring's Radiant Baby. I was like, oh, that's pretty interesting. And it, and it was on the black pavement. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. And I thought it was, I thought it was interesting. So eventually I got, I was going to school, I had to take the train to school, I took the six train to the four or the five and I went to, to uh, Alfred E. Smith House High School on 149th Street, 3rd Avenue. And it ended up me meeting Keith because I went out one evening and drew on every, almost every panel, black panel, uh, from I would say 125th Street to about maybe around Bleecker. And then a few days later, uh, Swatch Watch was having this contest at the Roxy and myself and a friend, another graffiti friend of mine named uh, Michael, Michael Chappelle, he went by UPT, we went to the event and at, at that event I had my very first silkscreen t-shirt of my robot head on. We went to an event, the event was going on, it was being filmed and the judges was Keith Herring and a couple of other people. And Keith um, got up from the table and he was trying to just going through the crowd and seeing what was going on. And I just he just happened to spot the robot head that I just silk screened onto his t-shirt. And he, he came through the crowd and my, my buddy Mike was like, yo, he might be Vandal Squad. And at the time there was this thing called the Vandal Squad where there was uh, uh, um, transit detectives that sort of try to infiltrate or look like a graffiti artist so they can uh, arrest us. They try to come into your little group or your little, your, your little whatever and act like they were writers just to arrest you. That, their job was to go around and find graffiti artists that were painting in the layups or, or, or whatever. So, and they kind of looked like us, you know what I mean? They were dressed like us, you know, so as Keith was coming to me, I folded my arms to cover the artwork. But he had seen it already, so he made a beeline straight to me. And he was, you know, he came and gave me this look like, you do that robot? And I was like, uh, I'm busted. He was like, no, I'm Keith Harry. And I was like, oh yeah. He says, oh, so you're the guy that does the robot head. Meaning that he saw all those black spaces done up before he could go out there and, and, and paint or draw them themselves. So right there, um, there was a friendship that happened. He asked me, if you give me that t-shirt that you're wearing, I'll give you my t-shirt. So in the middle of the Roxy roller ring, at this event, we exchanged t-shirts. He says, you know, I'm gonna be on camera so you might get some bubbles in the Okay, no problem. And right before he went back to sit down, he says, yo, would you like to collaborate with me? And I was like, yeah, okay. So at the time, there was no uh, cell phones and everything like that, so we exchanged phone numbers. He gave the phone number to my mother's house. He went back, a couple of days later, I get a phone call, and it's Keith on the line asking, are you ready? I'm like, who is this? He said, oh, it's, it's Keith Harry. Remember I met you at Roxy? Did you want to go and do? I was like, oh, okay, yeah. He says, yeah, so I'll meet you tomorrow, Monday, at Bleecker Street. So I said, okay. I'm thinking like, yo, who, the you know, who, call, who calls people and, and, and want to do collaboration, especially this guy? So Monday comes along, which was September 24th, 1984. I meet him at Bleecker Street. 
we, uh, we, 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 uh, we went to the subway, he had his thin chalk, I had my thick chalk just to make a little distinction, and we, we uh, drew on the black spaces from Bleecker down to uh, uh, Brooklyn Bridge, back up to 125th, and then back to Bleecker. We got kicked out of the subway twice. We didn't get any tickets, we got kicked out. And when we finished, we went to his studio to um, have lunch. So while I'm while I'm there, while I'm there, um, you know, he gave me some some drawing papers. So we collaborated. The subway we collaborated. At around the same time, Eric was beginning to make inroads in the music industry, lending his skills to his old friend Jazzy J's new projects. Like I said, Jazzy J, friend from the Bronx River. We went to school together, we went to Alfred E. Smith, he was a carpenter, I'm a carpenter. I had the morning class, we had the evening or the afternoon class, we had the same teacher, Mr. Mercy. Big up to Mr. Mercy. Jazzy went on to make a record called It's Yours with Tina Rock. When he made that record, he was on tour, so I hadn't seen Jazzy for a long time. One day he happened to come around my neighborhood in the park, just he was on White Plains Road, and he was in his road hand vehicle with this loud music playing. The car pulls up to me, tinted windows, the window comes halfway down, and I hear, or, so I knew it was somebody from school because we always uh, spoke to each other using our last names. So I look in the car, and it was, it was Jackson. He's like, yo, I've been looking for you, I'm starting this new studio, and I remember you did artwork because back then I used to draw in the margins of my, 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 my homework. And things. So he asked me to design his logo. And that's how I started in the hip hop game. I designed Jazzy's very first logo, the Jazzy J hand. And the story behind the Jazzy J logo and the hand is because if you're in Bronx River and they're playing in the back of the center, back in the center is on the stage, and then you have the table. So all you could see was the guy's hand going back and forth, and I remember that when I designed this logo. Eric went on to design the logo for Jazzy's record label, Strong City Records, and produce art and designs for a number of the artists signed to the label. So at this point, all the pieces were in place, the stage was set, and Eric's iconic robot creation was ready to jump into a new medium and take its place in history. Then I decided to create a comic because if anybody knows about the music business, the summer months, the artists are out on tour. I was supposed to go out with Busy B, I believe at the time. I designed his logo as well because he was part of the Strong City roster. And, but no one was around. So I was like, oh, here's my opportunity. And it wasn't a lot of studio time. No, no one was booking studio time this particular month. I think it might have been uh, April, April, May. So I just took the time to, you know, just dabble at creating a comic book because I always thought what I'm doing and the way this culture and this music is, is progressing, that there should be something that, you know, reaches out to them and speaks to the people that loves this, love the culture. The drawings that I was doing in the subway with Keith, right, look vastly different from the development of I finished the comic book. I took the comic book to Keith. It was just a working comic book at the moment. I said to Keith, I got this comic book. Do you remember the character that we did in the summer? He's like, yeah, I remember it. So when I showed him the comic book, he's like, oh, Eric, it's come a long way. It's, the progression is great. And I was like, listen, I'm looking for funding. He said, I want to be part of this. And that's how the Pop Shop ad got on the back of my comic book. I, I created the comic book the same way uh, the, the hip hop culture was created for uh, a specific community. I, I created it for us. Really, I created it for the folks that I was working with at Strong Seed Records. So, so uh, uh, Brand Nubians came through there, uh, Show and AG came through there, Fat Joe came through there, uh, um, um, Jazzy Joyce. Uh, um, and so many others, you know, it was pretty much just for that small community. How it got bigger was because I did it myself. I took it around to different comic book stores in the tribe, you know, in, in New York City. 
So one of the things that I admire about Eric Orr's work is that when you look at graffiti and street art of the time, you see a lot of iconography drawn from the world of comics. Characters such as, for example, Von Bode's Cheech Wizard. What Eric did was invent, take his character, take Rap and Max Robot, and move in the other direction from the world of hip hop iconography and street art back to the world of comics. And I think in so doing, he closed a, a pop cultural loop um, or completed a circuit there in a way that's very exciting, drawing together the cultures of hip hop iconography, the culture of street art and the culture of comics, and also creating an entirely original comic book in the process. Interesting enough, there's a connection with Vaughn Bodie, yeah. which is a big character in the graffiti culture. His son was in New York at one summer, I think it was the summer of 86, and he brought the book out to California. That's how we got to, to, to the West Coast. The, the, the reason why I, I started with the traditional size was because I wanted, to, I wanted the book to look like a traditional comic book. But then it went, the second issue, I went, and, I went ahead and, and um, it was a homage to International Graffiti Time. So it was a, sort of a zine fold out. So the, 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 the two others after that was the zine fold out, which was a homage to, uh, to phase two and, and other things. That's what that was. But by the end of 1986, after publishing the debut issue in three special editions, Eric began devoting more time to logo designs and other concerns and put comics on the back burner. The Max character, however, remained, his iconic robot head serving as Eric's visual signature. It did became my brand, you know, it was, it was synonymous with Eric Orr. Um, I, I went back into, you know, not went back into, things started to pick up with, with uh, Strong City Records, Don Barron's album came out, uh, Master of Ceremonies came out with Cracked Out, and, 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 and Sexy, so I started moving a little more with the hip-hop music uh, genre. You know, and I was on the road a lot, so that the, the book sort of got pushed to the side. You know, right after that, right after the Strong City movement, um, I went to Georgia, so that the robot really got um, pushed to the side then because I was raising my two boys, they were young at the time, but the robot was kind of still there. Um, when I got back, a gentleman by the name of uh, Lev, who runs Toy Tokyo somehow got in contact with me and told me that there was this train show that they were about to you know, put out, these plastic trains. And he wanted to be part of it. And I was like, oh, I don't know what to put on it. But so I put some robot heads on it. And it was in the, it was in the train show with a whole bunch of old, old friends of mine. And that's how it, it came back to the forefront. Even when Eric worked in other fields, Max Robot continued to make appearances evolving, transforming, and ever-present. And by the mid-2000s, Eric found himself drawn back into the world of comics. What brought comics back around? I was minding my business, <laughs> and um, Cornell University was archiving Van Bonnet's records at the time. They kept pulling up these logos that I created with Strong City Records. It was like, who's this guy? who creates all these cool-looking logos. And it was like, oh, that's Eric Orr. So uh, Ben Ortiz and Catherine Regan was like, well, Eric, you know, we would love to have those original drawings as part of the collection. And I was like, fantastic. They was like, where is it? I was like, oh, it's at my mom's house. They were looking through my collection of, of, of lo original logos. And what happened to be in that a pile of mess was a comic book. It was the Rap Max number one. And it was like, oh, wait a minute. What is this? And I'm not sure who turned it over. I believe it was Catherine. Turned it over and saw the Pop Shop ad on the back. And she's like, well, now how did this happen? So I had to tell that whole story. And she was like, wait a minute. Let's hold off on the logos. Let me. Let me, can I take this back up to Ithaca and do a little research? And I'm like, sure. And that's what they did. They took it up to Ithaca, they did a little research, and they was like, hey, we would love to have this in our collection. And 
this gentleman at the same time, his name is Patrick Reed, reached out to me and says, listen, I heard about this book. Are you the guy that did this book? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I did the book. And we had lunch, we had lunch, we talked about it, and he was like, listen, I'm doing this thing, it's called Hip Hop and Comics, and I really can't do it without you. Because I believe that this book is the, the, the epicenter of this culture of hip hop and comics. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll do it with you. And that's how we got back into the whole time. Now you know there's only eight Ivy Leagues, right? Somehow, no, I'm, I'm not gonna say somehow. I'm gonna say my buddy Ron Wimberly put Karen Green from Columbia University, put her on to this acquisition. I got an email from Ronald Wimberly, uh, who I've become good friends with. And he said, you need to know Eric Orr. Can I connect you? And I had no idea who Eric Orr was, but I trust Ronald Wimberly. So I said, sure, let's connect us. And uh, then Eric got in touch with me and he sent me like some links to what Max was and, you know, brought in the whole herring thing. You know, now I moved into Manhattan in 1978 and was coming into the city from like 1970 onward uh, because I lived just across the, the Hudson. Um, and uh, I worked at the Grand Hyatt as a bartender through almost the entire 1980s. And I would come up the subway from the, the seven up under Grand Central and there would be a corridor and there were always blank subway ad frames and with Keith Haring drawings on them. So to find out that Eric was part of that world, you know, again, it's like that notion that there are all these islands out there and you're on your island in 1984 and you don't necessarily know what the other islands are, much less who's on them. So uh, uh, I got very excited about the Herring connection because I remembered the Keith Herring very fondly from my 20s. And uh, uh, he's, I said, I'd love to come see your collection. So I went up to the Bronx, uh, got hopelessly lost because it was before I had a phone with GPS on it. <laughs> um, uh, and we just spent this fantastic afternoon going through his stuff, hearing, you know, the entire story. He had just finished packing up his hip hop archive for Cornell. And, uh, and he, you know, put together a little package of stuff that I could have for our collection so that I could allow people to come consult this seminal moment in, in the marriage of hip hop and comics. To me, like, all that like graffiti is its own kind of narrative right so like it max became sequential instead of being like a statement in and of you know himself uh which i think is really cool and it speaks a lot to the time and the place in which it was created and with eric's work which is not readily available you still kind of you feel that like you kind of understand that you couldn't be doing what you're doing if they didn't do what they were doing that's the real power of stuff like this right like it is affecting the world and it is it is sparking imagination and it is teaching people about themselves which i think is really cool it's amazing to be able to actually kind of trace your family tree you know in terms of like what i'm doing as a professional i can like trace lines now it's like oh it's like ancestry.com but for like <laughs> but for like my influences and <laughs> and that that's just it's invaluable and and whether it's his illustration or the like the few you know the few sequentials that people are able to glean here and there um you know it, it's something that like it does something that i think comics are supposed to do it does something that i think art is supposed to do which is invite people to engage with it and also like this is like a larger art thing but i feel like you know, we judge art by like how complex it is and how uh, how like inscrutable it is. And I think that that can be very like exclusive and uninviting. Whereas like Eric's work is just like, no, come in, see, look at all this cool stuff. I mean, that's what he does, right? Like he makes, he makes art that is easily identifiable and, and kind of like 
precise but simple in a way that makes it iconic. He makes it look easy and then you you're like, yeah, I can do no, I cannot. <laughs> like that that is something that I aspire to, right? To be able to to render a concept in a way that is in, you know, clean um, and easily recognizable uh, while still while still being, you know, I, I think complex. I think I think Max is more complex than we give him credit for, right? Like as a figure, even the like simple tag, it's like six lines, but not everyone can do that with six lines. <laughs> when I look at the work of Eric Orr, which in my mind follows very closely in the tradition of Simon Rodia, in creating uh, something out of things that people thought were nothing. There is no more hip hop aesthetic than that. There is no more hip hop conception than that because it flows all the way from the, uh, uh, the, the griot tradition from Africa into jazz, into blues, into soul food and lots of other aspects of creation. So this specific work, I believe, is one of the lost pieces of DNA. The fact that it's been out of print for so long is kind of a tragedy. As a culture, because of our reliance on a certain focus of hustle and a certain kind of commercial nature of things, we are losing amazing work that we will never see or that will never really shine in a bigger way. So that's why I also think that bringing this specific work to life is very important, and I'm very appreciative for the opportunity to discuss it, uh, because we need to say, what things are we leaving behind? And bringing those things to light, I believe, is enormously important. Uh, Eric, or being the person that created the first hip-hop comic, uh, out the gate, that is uh, an accomplishment that uh, has to be um, acknowledged outright, simply because, you know, it, he was the first. Um, it, it gave hip hop, in my opinion, uh, a validation that, that, that nobody saw come. Who, who would have, who would have thought that, you know what I mean? We would, you know, develop this quote unquote subculture, um, enough to where we would be, you know, creating like uh, pulp fiction about it and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So I think it's dope. Eric is definitely... Uh, a permanent fixture in the hip hop house, if you're feeling what I'm saying. Yeah. His, uh, his art is unparalleled, one. Two, one of the only guys who really got uh, innovative styles with graffiti, you know what I mean? Who was, we was out here trying to like bomb with permanent, you know, uh, materials like paint. And they were doing with chalk jars. First off, it was one person who did, you know, did all these things. Cause at first you, you don't really put two and two together. And so to see Max, it was, Oh yeah, it made complete sense because you saw all the, the traces amongst record labels and everything else. And then to finally see that, yeah, this guy did this. It, it, I think for every artist, that's kind of, that's the dream is to be, to someone to uncover the artifact of the real article, you know, which was this book, obviously. But I wasn't aware in 86 when that came out. I would have loved it. It would have been the best thing in the world because as far as I was concerned, there was no one doing any sort of graffiti centric uh, you know, illustration or comic books back then. Well, I did not know the name Eric Orr until years later. I mean, it was seeing all those pieces and seeing all those elements and then realizing, oh, this is the same dude. I've seen the photos that have been online and then that have been behind the panels that we've all been discussing. I'm familiar with the artwork. I'm familiar with Eric. I met Eric. We traded art. I've got his, some of his original stuff, but I've never actually held that book, which is part of the awesome part of it. I've never held Fantastic Four number one either. This is a mythical kind of an, a thing. And this is a thing where it, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, yeah, we all want to copy and it's great, but there's that mythic quality to that, I think is, uh, I think is important. My whole thing is that it has this mystique about it. People do want to see it. People do want it. It's a contribution to the visual, the, the visual art of this culture as well as the crossover into comics. And I think that that's profound in terms of what Eric did because he had both, he was in both feet in those camps. It's all part of a tapestry. That's how I look at all the stuff we're talking about. Hip hop is a genre. It's a, it's a discipline. It's an art form that typically repurposes things and makes them hip hop, right? Lee jeans were not made for B-boys. B-boys did what they did with Lee jeans and made them hip hop. Adidas on their own were not made for hip hoppers. Hip hoppers made Adidas hip hop. You know, the techniques, the techniques turntables were not made with hip, hip hoppers in mind. You know what I'm saying? It, it was the hip hoppers that transformed it. So in a world where we read comic books that weren't really thinking about us or 
weren't aimed at us. We repurposed it and gave it new meaning and, you know, changed it, what it meant and who it appealed to. But this was made specifically for this audience in mind by someone who was from <laughs> that audience and grew up in the culture. So that changes everything. I was always fascinated with like underground comic books and independent uh, comic book publishers. So I was around for stuff like um, the the X Mites, you know, all the small stuff that seemed like they were one offs. And I was doing this um, research about comic books because I wanted to do a, a specific um, uh, piece and sell it to somebody when people were inviting. And while I was doing research, I was like finding out that the first hip hop comic book was this thing by a dude who was an artist I was familiar with because I saw his art on, you know, all the vinyl covers and like my favorite groups from back in the like the late eighties. And I was like, he did a comic book and like there's one panel and there's a picture of like rapping Max the robot, right? And I'm like, okay, so that exists, but there are things that you know exist and happened, but you can't access it. It was one of those issues where I was like, I don't know anybody who has it. There's no digital archive. I don't know anybody with it. And then later on, I find out they're like, hey, they have it, but Cornell has everything, you know, almost. So it was one of those issues, right? Where like, you're someone who's into a field like comic books and hip hop and, and the nexus between that and graffiti art and where they all cross you know, with like Mark Bodie and Von Bodie when he made Cobalt 60, he took it up for his dad. And these are all your interests. And you wonder who was the first? What was the first? Where is it? It's funny because you talk about movements, but I think you can only talk about a movement when either it's over or it's really going, right? Like I think the people that, uh, pioneer is such a weird way to say it, but the people that are, are doing these things uh, initially, um, either separately or together are just trying to create, right? Like to me, that feels like that's why his work in general, but especially Max feels really authentic because it's just like, well, I was just making art. That's just what I needed to do to like survive as a person. And there you have it, the origin story of hip hop comics. And the best part is this is a story that's still being written. Eric is a full-time artist, and Max and his counterpart Maxine, Robot, continue to appear in all manner of venues, from Comic-Cons to art shows to installations, and most recently popping up across New York City in an acclaimed series of public service posters promoting health and safety practices. In 2016, we put together a special Ashcan edition that we brought to San Diego and released at Comic-Con International to celebrate Max's 30th anniversary, and, as we speak, Eric and I are discussing plans to compile and release a full Max Robot collection that will bring these stories back into print and give audiences a chance to enjoy them anew, or in many cases, for the very first time. So stay tuned. And now, to wrap things up, I want to thank all the guests who've joined us, lent their insights and enthusiasms this time around, and all of those who have been a part of these hip-hop and comics panels over the last decade. Thank you also to everyone at Comic-Con International, the entire team that makes these events possible, and gives us all a space to come together and share these things we love. Thank you to you, the audience, who attend these programs, tune in online, and ask questions, and join in the conversation, and share all these moments with us. And a very special thanks to Eric Orr and his artistic alter ego, Max Robot, for making all of this possible. I'm Patrick A. Reed. Thank you for watching. We'll see you again soon.